live. Oh. This Hang On Air is live. <laughs> Hi, friends. Cool. So, what do you think? Should we wait a few minutes and see, or should we get rolling? Is there anyone? Um, it's not showing me anyone on the call. Maybe like a minute or two and then get started. Okay. Yeah, Ali, I don't know. I still haven't decided yet. <laughs> cool. Um, so everyone, we have a like Q&A bar on all of I think it's available from your left-hand side of your screen. Um, so we can be like watching out for questions and anyone listening in can on ask them through there. Um, cool. I think we should just get rolling and people can come on in as, as and when they want. Um, so welcome, everyone, to our second webinar of the Sustain Us COP22 Creative Challenge. I'm Morgan, the COP22 delegation leader. Um, so great to be speaking with you, whether you joined us for the first webinar or not, whether you have got started with the Creative Challenge or not, whether you're feeling totally confident or this is a whole new world for you, we're so excited that you're here, skilling up, and yeah, excited to support you through this. Um, so before making some exciting introductions to our special guests on this call, I just kind of wanted to set some context for what brings us to this webinar. Um, so as you all know, this creative challenge is totally new for Sustain Us this year. Every year we have incredible young people like yourselves, climate activists and advocates from around the country who channel their passion and their hearts into writing an application which goes into a Google Drive. And like we learned on last week's webinar, these stories that people write, their hearts and souls that they pour out about why they do this work and why they might want to travel to the UN, they have power. And so this creative challenge is about putting that power to the service of our movement and using it to build something. And I think a really key part of that is accessing the media. And so maybe we'll unpack a bit what that means in a moment, but whether it's traditional media, alternative media, social media, it's tonight we're here to kind of talk about how to access that world, however new or like seemingly impenetrable it may sound to you. We're hopefully going to make that seem a little bit easier. Um, okay. So the moment you've all been waiting for, I'm just so excited to introduce our two really special guests, dear friends and Sustain Us co-collaborators, um, Ali and Leahy. I worked with them both in the COP21 delegation last year where they were my media making parents um, heading up the media team for us all in Paris. And so... Maybe I thought you could just introduce yourselves one at a time with your history with Sustain Us. And as a kind of fun tidbit, the first piece of media you can ever remember making happen or getting published in your young organizer lives. I see some thinking faces. <laughs> um, Ali, if you're feeling good, you can go first. My name My is Elle and I co-led the media team for COP21 with Leahy last year in Paris. And we also attended COP20 together and did some media work there in uh, Peru. I'm trying to think about the first time I was ever interviewed, and I feel like it was for my local paper uh, in Worcester, Vermont, town of 1,000 people when everyone's home. And it was with um, just a local reporter, a family friend who wanted to interview me about, um, I don't even remember what I was doing, but something related to climate work. And it was just a very informal phone interview, and she did a small write-up in a weekly 
newspaper for our 1,000 person town called The Grapevine. And I think that was the first time I had ever been quoted or put in the newspaper for anything besides sports. And um, it was great. It, it uh, was local and, and easy, um, low, low stakes. Awesome. Welcome, Allie. Hi, Leahy. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Leahy. I, I think I first I first got involved with Sustain Us um, when I went to the CSOC D delegation, so the Commission on Social Development, back in 2013. Um, and I've been on three COP delegations with Sustain Us, uh, COP19 Warsaw, COP20 in Lima, and COP21 in Paris. Um, I led a delegation to the Commission on Social Development in 2014, so I am a longtime family member of Sustainus and look forward to welcoming all of you um, and welcoming you on this journey. I, I can't remember the first media piece I ever did, but I can remember the first op-ed I ever wrote. And I remember it so vividly because it was before I got involved with UN work. And um, it was in response to this terrible column uh, this was for the Montreal Gazette, which is the biggest newspaper in Montreal, um, English-speaking newspaper. And this regu like regular columnist wrote about how young people need are entitled and they need to like put some. He said something like put some sweat into helping others and volunteer. And it made me really angry because I felt like young people were the only people who were actually doing things worth anything. Um, and I was also at the same time at this really corporate conference about sustainability that was totally greenwashing. So I wrote this really feisty um, op-ed, I think I must have been 18, either 18 or 19 at the time, um, about how young people are actually the ones who are doing things and contrary to what this like mean um, columnist was saying, if you look at the so-called adults in society, like the ones who were at this conference, like our environment minister was speaking at this conference, they actually were the ones who weren't doing much. And I just remember it was something I wrote kind of in a rage, and I had never like thought about pitching anything before, and never really like thought about what that process was like, and definitely did not think that they would take it, um, especially how like feisty it was. But they did take it, and they put a little bit of edits in there. But it was really just kind of a whirlwind experience for someone who had not really thought a lot about pitching a story before. Cool. Thank you so much for that. Um, I should probably try and answer this question too. Um, I think definitely my first main experiences with the media were in my college newspaper and getting sitting down with reporters to talk about divestment and fossil fuel divestment and the experience of maybe being misquoted and maybe kind of trying to see what on earth is going to happen with this and kind of the feeling of like not always being in control of the media and then later on realizing that an op-ed is such a powerful way to be in control of the message you're getting out there and yeah was built a lot of skills in that department in Paris um, on the COP21 delegation under especially Leahy's really careful tutelage in this department and yeah I found it really empowering to kind of say, wow, like I might actually have a story that could get published by someone and that I can have control over what that might look like. So yeah, super excited for this conversation with you both. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I guess the first thing that I wanted us to talk about was um, just kind of defining what we mean by media, kind of what it means to you to engage with the media and why you find that important for your work with Sustain Us and maybe if you could tell us about other places that you've done media work as well. That would be great. Maybe we can have Ali first again. So, so I, I started my work with the media, so to speak, when I worked as a state divestment organizer for 350 Vermont and had to help basically get attention for some of the events that we were doing locally. Um, <clears throat> and that meant getting the word out to local television stations, local newspapers, and then also putting it on our own social media where we had 
thousands of followers um, who were interested in hearing about what was going on in the climate world in Vermont. And uh, then I went on to serve as the press secretary for um, Zephyr Teachout's 2014 gubernatorial bid in New York. She's currently running for Congress, and I think that she will win despite losing the gubernatorial race in 2014, but that looked more uh, more traditional media, and we had other folks who were doing some of the digital side of things, but for that it was more about pitching stories about this candidate who was taking on the establishment and um, trying to bring a new voice to politics in New York. And so working with specifically with newspapers and television and traditional media outlets and right now I work as a communications director for Rights and Democracy, which is in Vermont and New Hampshire, an organization looking to support workers' rights and act on climate change and do anti-racism work in, um, in a bi-state manner, trying to build the stories of both of those states to uh, gain power. And uh, so that's bring, bridging the work of social media and traditional media, doing some of both. And uh, in terms of like my experience, it's more traditional media than social media, although I do end up doing quite a bit of social media. Um, my expertise is more in traditional media and helping um, get reporters and newscasters out to events, um, thinking about the preparation to get, um, to get attention for events and um, the writing that goes into helping make that happen and the outreach. Awesome. Thank you. Lee, any thoughts on yeah, maybe a bit of your media work story and what it means for you now? Definitely. So my first formal media experience was when I uh, was on, so a little bit of background, I'm Canadian, I'm from Montreal, um, and I was working on um, the media communications team for Power Shifts Canada, which was in 2012. Um, totally new, had no idea what I was doing, uh, had no idea what a press release looked like. And I think as time has gone on, been working a lot in sort of informal volunteer media capacities. So media for the cop delegations, um, doing media work for Power Shift in the US, uh, which happened in 2013, um, and mainly with the fossil fuel divestment campaign at Dartmouth. And I think similarly to Ali, there is, um, there definitely is this, like, social media and traditional media tend to complement each other in ways that people might not realize. So for me, for example, and maybe we'll get into this a little bit later, but I, I hate Twitter, but I use Twitter all the time to live tweet events and just be very active because what I've noticed is that when it comes to traditional media, when it comes to journalists who are looking to interview people or news anchors who are looking for um, people who are on the ground somewhere, being that person who's live tweeting, who's very active, makes, it, makes you very accessible to that traditional media. So I see in a way that social media helps traditional media in that way. Um, the other part of social media that I think is important but is kind of ignored in a way or, or not not really acknowledged is how much social media helps communicate what's going on to people who are back home. So when it comes to COP, I see Twitter as being important because whenever I'm whenever there's something happening, even today looking at Democracy Spring and all these incredible actions that are happening in DC, as someone who can't be there, I'm following social media to like see what's going on and keep up to speed. Um, and so I think that's, that's an important part of social media that we don't really think about. And then there's all these other kinds of media that we can use. Um, I, I think social media is a powerful tool to communicate across different groups of people. So I was involved with starting tumblers of different cops, um, which most people might not think of as media. but um, putting together all these gifts that tell a story of what it's like to actually be a young person at the UN. So like Ali, I think traditional media is really important. Um, I definitely think traditional media is, is the, more, the most efficient way to reach a very wide range of people and have a broader conversation. But I also think that social media plays a really big role in helping facilitate that access to traditional media. Cool. 
Thank you both so much for some of those stories and the work you've done. Um, so all of our applicants right now are kind of just getting started with the first round of our challenge, which is to tell their own story about the work that they do and why they do it. And so this might be op-eds for people that love to write, but maybe it's going to be a photo essay or a podcast or a series of creative social media. Right? We're asking people to kind of challenge themselves to get it out there onto a media platform of their choice, whether it's their campus newspaper, maybe it's the Huffington Post, maybe it's the Guardian, maybe it's their friend's blog. It's whatever feels like that kind of next step in pushing themselves. Um, so I guess to either or both of you, kind of, if you were in the shoes of our applicants, like, how would you get started with this challenge? I can take that. Um, I don't know, Ali, if you have other thoughts, but one of the things that to me was the most empowering, um, or at least opened the most doors, was pitching. I had never thought about pitching before. Um, for those of you who don't know what pitching is, most of the time you'll notice that in the newspaper or traditional media, um, you know, like more mainstream media, they'll give the option where you can submit a, an, an opinion piece and they'll, you know, give you guidelines and whatever. It has to be 800 words, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but oftentimes you can submit a piece and all you have to do is wait and see if they get back to you. And if they don't get back to you, that means they probably are not going to take your piece. But that takes so much effort, so much work, so much emotional investment to write an op-ed that's geared towards a specific audience. Um, and pitching, basically, is, is the process of maybe spending you know 20 minutes working on an email to the editor of a specific newspaper or media source. Um, where you pitch your story. You say, okay, I want to write like this kind of story. This is why I think the story would be interesting to your readers. This is when I can write it by. Would you be interested? And pitching, A, saves you a lot of time because you don't have to, um, you don't spend all this time writing a piece that may or may not get accepted. But B, also makes you look so much more professional when you are pitching uh, rather than just submitting an opinion piece. So it increases the chances that your piece will get accepted. And uh, as someone who had not had been rejected a lot, um, you know, I had this small period of time where I was writing a lot of op-eds, and then a, a year or so where no matter what I sent out, it would just was not getting. I was not hearing back from anyone. When I suddenly started to pitch, um, I was getting more more media interested than I had time to actually write pieces. So I think pitching for me was a really good skill to have just for any kind of organizing or, or just as a concerned citizen. But it, it made me save a lot of time and it it made me, it, it kind of took the stress away of writing this entire op-ed and not knowing if someone was going to accept it. I knew whether or not they said yes if they were going to be interested in a piece and then it made it so much easier for me mentally to write the piece because I knew that it was something that this editor was going to publish. Well, that is I was wondering, I was wondering I, what do we mean by, mean by it? Uh, how, do we, how do we find out who those find people, out who are, those people are, are? I generally, well, I first of all, I have a massive press list that has been incredibly helpful to me that I've collected over years of various jobs. But if you don't have a press list and you're not sure who to contact, um, feel free to look on the websites of the organizations or the newspapers that you're thinking about pressing, uh, pitching to because they often have contact information. And if they don't have contact information, they all often have Twitter accounts. Um, and so you can go on and sometimes I even pitch through Twitter and tweet at reporters and say, you know, um, would you like to direct message with me about a story that I'm thinking about? Would you like to can get on the phone at some point um, and start a conversation through Twitter? Because email, I think, for reporters often gets lost, but Twitter is a great way um, to get reporters' attention because they're always on it. And um, they, I think they get less, they don't get quite as much contact through Twitter as they do through email, so they're more likely to get back to you. Um, 
And so yeah, just thinking about who is your audience, and then who, where does your, who, what does your audience read or watch or listen to? And from there, thinking about, okay, who are the people who are writing those stories that, or creating those videos that people are watching? And pitching to them, getting in touch with them, um, whether it's through email or through Twitter, whatever is the best way to get in touch with them. Um, so that's, that's often what I do. Well, well, so, so right before, right before the school, right, you right. mentioned to me that you'd actually done some pitching today, <laughs> so I thought that maybe we could hear first from you, Lee, about what you pitched today and kind of how you went about it and what you think might make it a good pitch. Sure. Um, so. I am one of the leaders of Divest Dartmouth. Um, it's an incredible community of people who really care about making Dartmouth better. And we are organizing our first ever, like the first rally on climate change ever in the college's history on April 30th. Um, and we're trying really to just get as many people to show up. And if you are listening to this and are in the general area near Hanover, New Hampshire, you are definitely most welcome to come. Um, and I was basically working on an op-ed for the Concord Monitor, which is the big newspaper in the state. Um, pretty risky pitch. I don't know if they're actually going to get it accepted. The first thing I noticed was that they didn't have the, a, a straight up email that I could pitch to, so I had to do some sleuthing um, and found the name of the head opinion editor and then figured out a way, noticed that all the emails were organized by um, first initial and then last name at cmonitor.com. So I tried that out and it worked. It didn't bounce back. So um, that's one <laughs> first trick is trying to find out who you're going to email. Um, but the second thing is I have this template, which I actually think may be in the resources um, that Morgan, you have on the Systems website. But there's this template that I have to give credit to um, Diego Ortiz, who's an incredible and young environmental journalist from Costa Rica, taught me this. But it's basically three very short paragraphs. Um, first is one where you introduce yourself and you establish your credibility. So in my case, it was something like, hi, my name is Hiona. I am a, a senior at Dartmouth. So like that's why it's relevant for me to, to be writing to a New Hampshire-based newspaper. Um, and I also um, am one of the leaders of the divestment campaign. I am an, and I'm a climate scientist. I'm studying climate science. Second paragraph, why am I... Um, like, what do I want to pitch? So I said I would like to pitch a piece on um, what it's like being a researcher who also is engaged in advocacy. And I think this is timely because, and I mentioned this rally. And then my last paragraph is kind of like, why is this specifically of interest to your readers? So I think this is of interest because it's a local issue. It's related to issues that people are thinking about in Concord. Um, and then the last thing I say is I can have you know, an X number word piece ready by X date. So that way you give them a timeline and they can get back to you. Um, and if you already know where you're going to pitch and you know, for, for example, when a, there's a newspaper I know that will only take 625 word pieces, then I'm obviously going to write, I'll take a 625 word piece. So do a little bit of digging first to see like who it is you're going to send this email to um, and what, it, what their guidelines usually are so they know that you've done your research. Um, but just really those three short paragraphs uh, is usually enough. And it doesn't take that much work, but it also forces you to think through what framing you'll, you'd be using for that particular you know, media outlet. Sweet. Thank you. One thing I wanted to add to that that Leahy taught me in terms of pitching is if you have any connection at all to the editor you're writing to. So... I know I had really good luck in Paris when I wrote, Lee Yona gave me your email. Um, and so that can be a place to start, even if it's a somewhat tenuous connection. Maybe it's someone else from your campaign wrote for that newspaper before or something like that. It doesn't hurt to throw that in to make your email seem less random. Um, Ali, were you up to some pitching today? Oh, you're just on mute. I will. Um, I think you have to unmute yourself. You have to unmute yourself. So I mentioned I was. Um, I work for Rights and Democracy, and our organization 
kind of created some news for itself, which is one way that you can get media um, is doing something newsworthy. So our organization launched an open letter last week uh, to the superdelegates of Vermont who have committed to vote for Hillary Clinton despite 86.1% of Vermont uh, Democratic primary voters supporting Bernie Sanders. Um, and so we launched this open letter to them saying, you know, this is out of step with uh, the majority of Vermonters who support this other candidate, and it's inappropriate for you to be voting for um, Clinton. And we got five over 5,000 signatures in under a week, and it, um, our open letter completely took off. And so we're holding a press conference next week to deliver the petition signatures, and one of the superdelegates has actually changed his position since the open letter came out. And so we're delivering the petitions right outside of his office, and... Um, so the pitching that I was doing was to local reporters saying, hey, we're doing this delivery um, of, this, of this open letter, and will you join us? So I, I was actually just on Twitter um, tweeting at different reporters saying, you know, will you, will you join us for this event? And um, got a little bit of feedback from them. And I'll do some more phone call, follow-up phone calls and things to try to get them out for, um, for next Wednesday. But just to make sure that they'd seen the media advisory that I put out, so I, um, a couple days ago, actually I guess it was just yesterday, yesterday I emailed out a media advisory that had the, the basics of the event, um, who, what, where, when, why kind of thing, and then put that on our website and on our Twitter, and um, today was just doing some um, tweeting out reporters to make sure they'd seen the advisory, linking the advisory to tweets to them, and uh, we'll be doing some follow-up phone calls as I mentioned, but uh, just kind of getting the ball rolling, getting some interest among the Vermont Press Corps around this event. Cool, cool. Thanks. Um, that's so exciting. Um, great. So I feel like we've kind of run through the process here of what it might look like for our applicants, all of you wonderful watchers and listeners, to try and get your story out to the media. Um, I just want to say for anyone that is tuning in live, feel free to submit your questions through, I think the Q&A bar should be on either the left or the right hand side of your screen, um, and we'll get to those. Um, but yeah, while we have Lehi and Ali here, cop veterans and media makers extraordinaire, I thought it could be fun to just hear some of your like highlights of making media at COP. There's so much madness of what that looks like each year, whether it's world famous journalists that you're chasing around or trying to get something published and it happening beyond your wildest dreams or just kind of some fun memories to give people a sense of what storytelling and media work looks like on the delegation. Um, Lee. You're up. I'm thinking, I'm trying to think of the best stories. Um, I have one, maybe I'll do two stories, but one is kind of, it was in the lead up to COP. Um, I was interning in DC over the summer and I went to this event that was being hosted and they had the French ambassador to the US there and um, a bunch of people, I can't even remember, like the head of the climate change portion of the World Bank, like all these important people. And I remember um, I was live tweeting the event and the French ambassador to the US was saying these terrible things. I don't know what was up with him that day, but he was not on point with like the talking points. And I I just quoted him. I didn't say anything, I didn't, you know, insinuate anything that he said. Um, but he had said some things that maybe he meant as a joke and then didn't realize came out sort of the wrong way, and he blocked me on Twitter, which was like, oh my god, the French ambassador just blocked me on Twitter. Um, and that just kind of started this little media storm where um, all these people started targeting him on Twitter, saying, how is this possible? Like, you're silencing youth voices. And it kind of opened up a little bit of a conversation with not so much in terms of media covering this in any way, but... Um, people putting pressure on someone in a space of power um, because of what happened. So I think that's a good example of, of something of, a, of where social media really played a big role. 
I think for me, as one of the media coordinators with Ali this past year, COP21, my biggest goal was to get someone paid for one op-ed. That's all I wanted is one person to get paid because that's usually how it works when, you know, quote-unquote adults um, pitch stories. They, they get paid to write them and young people are so often exploited for this. Um, we're, we, you know, we, we are grateful sometimes just to have the opportunity to have our voices heard in some kind of platform, let alone do we care about getting paid. And I think for me one of the coolest things was um, I had long story made this very short connection with a reporter at Mashable um, and had kind of tried to maintain the connection over a couple of months and then when Paris came around we just tweeted at him like Morgan was saying we just tweeted pictures at him and he responded and um, a few people sorry the library announcements going off don't pay attention to that um, <laughs> but the it was really great because people actually were able to get paid and also were able to get published in Mashable and Thought Catalog and all these bigger more mainstream media spaces all just because they tweeted at reporters and editors that they knew Well, I can. I can. I had this. I had this real experience of being in a meeting with um, some kind of business leaders from Facebook, the actual company, and was sitting there just kind of going like, "Ah, what is happening right now? We're a lot of U.S.-based youth climate activists in this meeting at." a climate conference with Facebook talking about social media and its role or not in building our movement and I had a lot of feels about this meeting and just like scribbled it down into a piece of writing and got talking to Leahy about like who on earth would publish this story like who who does this fit with like w how might I be able to get these ideas out to a wide audience and she was like oh, Mashable they might do this kind of thing um, and they ended up not wanting to take that piece because they work closely with Facebook, but turned to me and said, can you just write something about what it's like to be a youth delegate at COP? And I was like, oh, I could definitely do that. And ended up getting that published, which was so exciting for me. And it got thousands of shares on the internet and was just like this really empowering experience of going from like having thoughts inside my head in a meeting to actually being able to share those with a broader audience which is not something I'd imagined being able to do before so yeah thank you Lee. <laughs> um, Ali media madness from COP Ali, I'm afraid you're on mute again. <laughs> that should be better. Um, so I think there's two ways to get media. One is to come up with a great idea and to pitch it and to get a story written. Um, and the other is to like is to do something that gets media attention. Um, and the Sustain Us delegation did that in a number of ways. One of the ways was um, through actions at COP. Um, and I, when I was at COP, worked with a group of folks um, when we found out that uh, political leaders from our states were coming to the UN uh, to, to sit on a local climate leaders talk when in fact the, all of the all of the politicians who were on that panel were supporting fossil fuel infrastructure projects at home. And so we came together and we said, you know, this is really, it's just wrong for them to get a platform at uh, the UN climate talks as climate leaders when in fact they're, they're pushing uh, fracked gas pipelines and compressor stations and oil export terminals and all these things. And so um, we ended up getting a ton of media when we interrupted them in their speeches during this panel and um, got lots of shares on videos of us interrupting them and um, interacting with them at these panels and I think that sort of like 
disruptive civil disobedience type of action is also um, it's just another way to get news and another way to um, help elevate different stories. So there are lots of different ways to make that happen. Um, but at COP, that was one of the things that I prioritized was a more um, kind of like personal, live time, real life interaction with people in power because one of the things that media can do, and one of the reasons that I feel like is important to engage with media is to get reactions from people in power and get them to respond to us because that's where our, in some ways, that's where our power is, is through, um, it's through a power shift in helping elevate the stories of folks who might not be otherwise heard. Um, and interacting directly with people in power, especially at these highly publicized spaces, is one way to do that. And so I felt like it was important to take the opportunity to um, directly address people in power and get them to respond. And we, we ended up doing that. Many of the people who were on that panel ended up having to send out um, send out press releases or get their spokespeople to respond to us or personally respond um, to the issues that we had raised. Um, so I think for me, um, interrupting my state governor, the governor of the state of Vermont in Paris was something that um, has had, not only had an impact right then, but also has had an ongoing impact for people that I work with in Vermont because it's something that they can use to rally around going forward. Yeah, and just, yeah, adding, and just adding to that, I think, Ali, you bring up a really important point in that something that's really special about COP itself is that you have access to people in power that you, as a young person, might not get otherwise. So, and oftentimes it feels like it's rather futile within the COP space because you feel so powerless in the you know face of this like huge negotiating process but the reality of it is you actually have a lot of access to people who can make important decisions back home and that's really hard to get and so you just brought up a really important point Ali in that um, you know COP is an opportunity to think about other campaigns that you have going on and how you can leverage that power and leverage that access and also leverage your um, position as a youth delegate at the UN to s use that as a platform to speak on these issues. I, I think um, we kind of, I, maybe at least I do, um, I kind of forget how valuable it is to be going to COP or how much it, it is a real it is a real privilege and it gives you an opportunity to really um, speak out in ways that you might not be able to otherwise. Yeah, thank you so much, Ali, for sharing that story. Definitely that action was, like, for me, one of my most, like, heartfelt moments at COP. Even just sitting in the audience, I was, like, shaking with kind of the, yeah, the power. Yeah, the power. In that in moment. That. It was profoundly humbling and humbling and grateful to you and able to write about that story. About that story. Sitting up late at night, like late trying to, like, trying to. I was thinking to you, Morgan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was incredible. Um, cool. Well, again, those of you on this call, please feel free to submit your questions through our little question box. Um, I guess one thing, which is a bit of a shift as well, but just because we have the privilege to have you two here on this call. I know Leahy especially, I love the, often the kind of vulnerability and truth telling that you bring to some of the writing you do and I was wondering if you could kind of speak to um, what it's like to kind of put yourself out there in sharing your story or how it feels to maybe, yeah, offer up a piece of yourself and not knowing whether it's going to matter to someone else or that process for you. Totally. Um, so I wrote that first op-ed I ever wrote, I mentioned earlier, but in my mind, like, 
demarcation of when I became someone who did a lot of media work was the third op-ed I've ever written, and it was for that same newspaper, um, but it was <laughs> it was at the Rio Plus 20 UN Summit, so this was like a, a special summit. It wasn't COP. It was the Commission on Sustainable Development, very related, and um, it was my first ever UN conference, and it was terrible. I think it was the first time that I ever noticed or that it ever I ever realized that like holy cow our governments are actually not doing what they're supposed to be doing our leaders are not actually representing our best interests and it was this just you know ridiculous moment which I think anyone who's ever been to COP can relate um, where you just have this like cynical spiral of like why am I even here and I wrote an op-ed, and the title of it was something like, at Rio Plus 20, I'm ashamed of being Canadian. And Canadians are not very patriotic, not as patriotic Amer as Americans, but this was like, this really struck a chord with people. How dare you say that you are ashamed, like we are supposed to be the most one of the most diplomatic countries in the world. And I will never forget, um, this was before they used to moderate comments or make it tied to your Facebook profile or whatnot. So I just saw everything before it was reported at spam, and people said, such terrible things about me like oh my god yet another nincompoop who's like drunk the leftist kool-aid and like all these like Lee Hiona, you are a terrible person and you need to go back to school and learn history because you clearly don't know any of it all these really really hurtful things um, that were obviously sent and I definitely think you learn at a certain point to just not look at the comments um, not engage the trolls and develop a little bit of a thick skin but I think inherently Something I have always noticed in writing is that I can write from a more academic standpoint or a more um, scientific lens. I can talk about the facts, which, you know, things should be grounded in facts, of course. But if you talk in a way that's about facts, it will not strike people as much as if you tell a story. Um, an example of this was I was I do Arctic work, and I was recently at a conference where President Obama spoke. Um, it's called Glacier. And I wrote four news pieces. Um, there were requirements. I was there on a press pass. And three of them were, were pretty objective, fact-based. You know, like, here are the things you need to know about this summit. Like, this is the outcome of the summit. Here was approaches that happened at the summit. And the one that piece that I wrote that was not, it was totally an op-ed, was about a cab driver I met who was driving me to this conference and who was the most incredible person I had met, more incredible than President Obama, than John Kerry, than any of these other people because he got it. He knew what we were facing and he cared about future generations. And this one op-ed got more traction by far than any of the other pieces combined. And I, I think that um, when we tell a story, when we when we use the I or the we and we, we give that description and, and we put a little bit of ourselves out there, people see our, see themselves in us. And people can feel that. And I think that when it comes to climate change, we spend so much time talking about the facts and debating about the facts, but you can't debate your own story. Like that's that's your own truth. So being able to put yourself out there is scary. You are most likely going to get vilified by someone who has thankfully not doing anything more productive with their time than like wasting it on the internet trying to attack you. Um, but you, I think a really important piece of advice is just don't, don't look at the comments. Don't, don't look and, and don't engage with that and know that for every person that's wasting their time trying to like tear you down on social media or like think, you know, who, who might think, might not like what you've written there, there's going to be at least 10 people who who this speaks to and to me that's it's always worth the risk um, and I do think it comes with a little bit it takes time like I think I definitely put, I'm, I'm trying to put myself out there more often um, but I would encourage people to to tell personal stories because that's what really speaks to the public more than any other fact because it makes it real and it makes it human for them That was beautiful. Thank you so much. I totally recommend going to check out Leahy's article about the cab driver. Maybe we can send you the link somehow. Um, I actually, when I was traveling to Paris for COP21, I spent six months bicycling along the way, collecting stories of grassroots activism and 
both solutions and resistance-based work. And I was staying on a farm on the west coast of Sweden. And I was sitting there late at night with this incredible thinker named Mickey. And he starts describing this article he'd read from a young person talking about their voice being heard or not heard at a international conference talking about the Arctic. And like all these bells were going off and I was like, was it was there a cab driver in in this story? And yes, this person on the west coast of Sweden had read Leahy, my dear friend's article from across the world. So it's it's pretty unbelievable how the ideas and the stories that we put out into the world can ripple across. Um, so yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, so we have two questions in our question box, and I think they're related, so I'll kind of read them out for us together. Um, Jonathan said, Leahy, it's awesome. You can claim to be a climate scientist as one of your, one of your qualifications when pitching. Um, what if we aren't necessarily qualified climate scientists, just well-informed activists? How could we phrase that to make our opinions sound qualified? And then Kim said, how do you recommend establishing your legitimacy to the media as a young person? So I think those go nicely together. Um, yeah, maybe Lihi, if you want to take that, and then Ali, add any thoughts if you have not Definitely. Um, just if anyone wants to see that article, um, I just tweeted it, and it's at Lihi Yona, um, so you can find me on Twitter. Um, I think Ali might be better. Ali has a lot of media experience, and she might be better suited to answer the credentials article uh, question. I think, I mean, I'm obviously not like Jim Hansen or someone who has like decades of experience. Um, I'm studying biology, but I think it's all a question of how you frame things. So it could be as simple as I am taking part, um, you know, framing like your work in this creative challenge as like I am working on the COP22 delegations or, you know, making making that connection maybe um, or, um, you know, it's just, it, it's really, I don't know, Ali, you probably have a better way of, of giving this kind of advice because you're awesome at this, but finding a way to frame things that makes it sound really legitimate. It doesn't, doesn't necessarily have to be like you are like the UN youth ambassador on whatever um, or like you are a physicist studying solar cells but if you find a way to frame who you are um, and give yourself a little bit of legitimacy even just like I'm a college student studying X that might be helpful but Ali I don't know if you have other thoughts. I think you nailed it I mean just However you want to choose to identify yourself, whether it's as a college student studying something that's relevant or as a uh, COP22 hopeful, <laughs> as someone working on the COP22 delegation. Um, I mean, I think just giving some context for who you are and why you're interested, that does it. I don't, I don't think that you have to be a climate scientist. I'm not a climate scientist. Um, you know, explaining the organization that you're working with or working for, um, giving a little background. I think that's really all you need. And to be honest, <laughs> so many of the people who do media work, who get attention on Twitter, have no, no credentials whatsoever and are just complete trolls and have, <laughs> you know, nothing to back themselves up but end up getting a lot of attention. And just a little bit of legitimacy goes a long way. So whatever your context, your background is. That was great advice. That was great advice. Both of you. Uh, uh, I was thinking just to kind of wrap this up, we could maybe just our words of wisdom and kind of hopes for our applicants heading into this challenge. I know it feels really big for a lot of people. It, media can be so intimidating and especially we're challenging you to put your own stories out there which as Leahy said is like what people want to see in the media they want to hear your personal hopes and dreams and fears and so 
that's a scary thing, but it's totally possible. Um, yeah, Ali, any any sending off thoughts for thoughts for everyone? Everyone. Thoughts. I always say that anyone can do my job and it's just a matter of having the tools to be able to do it. It's not it's not hard to get media. It's just about knowing where and when to access um, different reporters and pieces and we're here for you and we want to help you make that happen. So if you have any questions at all, feel free to email us, tweet at us. Um, my handle is at Allie Johnson Kurtz and we will get back to you and we want to support you in helping make this happen. It's not hard, but it does take a little bit of insider knowledge and we hope that we pass some of that on to you tonight. Um, but if you have any questions about um, additional pieces of information about how to make that happen, we would be happy to chat with you and um, get you some of that. Yeah, agree. Yeah, agree. I think that there's I think that there's a lot of opportunities out there for you. There's people who want to help you. Um, seriously, tweet at us or um, you know reach out to different folks that sustain us. I, I think if I had one piece of advice is just push yourself to do something that you are not comfortable doing. I really got involved with pitching only, purely because like I had this one friend Diego who's like, Lee, you should pitch. Here's how you pitch. Um, and I just so happened to be at this particular COP where I met Diego in a group of people that was focusing purely on media. So I was kind of pushed to do something that I didn't want to do. Um, a fun fact is actually I was waitlisted to the Canadian youth delegation to COP17 in Durban and they offered me a spot on the media team and I said no because I said I don't know how to do media, uh, which is so ironic. So if you, if you really um, push yourself, you'll be surprised. Like the worst that can happen if you send a pitch is they'll say no. Worst thing that can happen. And if you send, even I um, <laughs> talk about being vulnerable, I, saw, I sent a super, super personal piece that I wrote for a class um, to the Atlantic just on a whim. I had written it already. I was like, what have I got to lose? It's COP21. People are talking about this. They responded saying they read the piece and they were going to decline. And after that, I reached out to them saying, thank you so much for reading the piece. Can you give me any feedback? And they gave me. They were like, OK, here are some of the things we noticed. Um, and even you know, worst case scenario, if they say no to something, you can get a little bit of feedback and at least you have that experience of putting yourself out there. Don't expect it to be you know, super easy. I think expect to be a little bit surprised because we tend to be very hard on ourselves. But I think that it's definitely, definitely worth it. And if I could end with just one last story from Paris, um, there was one delegate who really wanted to pitch a story. He wanted to write it about um, I don't know Harry Potter, so this is going to end really badly, but like how this is our Patronus moment or something Harry Potter related. And it was kind of a niche story, and he, he pitched it to a bunch of places, and he, he put in all that effort, like wrote pitches, and just got no's like across the board, and then didn't give up, and finally he got it accepted, and it got published in Thought Catalog, which has a huge viewership. So, you know, and, and he was so excited and so happy when he finally managed to do this because it was, was a big deal for him. He'd never pitched before. He'd never gotten anything published before. So um, just trust yourself and trust your voice to take that leap and know that maybe, you know, even if it doesn't necessarily come super easily, just keep trying because the worst that's going to happen is they'll say no. That's the worst that can happen. And, happen. and just being just able to being tell able your story, tell your story and about that is really important. It's really important. And it makes a really and big difference. Sense. Go for it. Well, thank you both so much for those words of wisdom. I, yeah, I wanted to echo one thing that Ali said is please reach out to us. We're especially me, totally sitting at the end of my email inbox waiting to hear from you all. So I, yeah, if there's any way that we can support you in making this challenge seem more accessible, I, I just, I want to do that. And that it was a great idea of someone on last week's call to start a Facebook group for everyone. So if you haven't joined that yet, please do. Um, some really powerful story sharing has already begun with people writing their introductions there and 
hopefully that can be a place where we could maybe even share contacts. Maybe someone is doing some research about where they want to pitch and they're like, oh, I found an email for someone. Like, throw it up there. Maybe they'll end up getting a few emails, but that's great. Um, yeah, I'm feeling so good and so grateful for this conversation and thinking about all of the powerful work you're all going to be doing in weeks to come. Um, I guess my last piece of advice would be to bring up something Leahy said earlier, which is you are the expert at your own experience. Everyone has a story and yours is uniquely yours. No one else can tell it. So in that way you have no competition. <laughs> um, and yeah, wishing you all so much luck heading into this week, thinking about writing and whatever else you have going on in your lives. We are grateful you're engaging with this and us. So thank you so, so much, and have a wonderful rest of your evening. Good night. <laughs>